वक्रतुंडमाकाय सूर्यकोटिम प्रभा निर्विघ्न कुर मे देवा सर्व कार्यु सर्वदा श्री गुरुभ्यो नम नमस्ते फ्रेंड्स टीम परम वेदांता वेलकम्स यू ऑल टू दिशा फिफ्टी सेवन ए न्यू सीरीज ऑफ एन इनवर्ट जर्नी टू डिस्कवर अवर यूनर स्ट्रेंथ एंड हैप्पीनेस थ्रू भगवद गीता इन टू डेज सेशन विल बी कंटिन्यूइंग विद अवर स्टडी ऑफ क्षेत्र क्षेत्र योग विभाग योग दर्टीन चैप्टर विद वर्स एट टू नाइनटीन टू डेज मेन स्पीकर इज नॉन अदर दैन अवर यूर डॉक्टर हेगे सर हु विल एक्सप्लेन दीज वर्सेस ही विल ऑल्सो टच अप ऑन द टॉपिक ऑफ आत्मा एज एक्सप्लेन इन तत्व बोधा So today we have a special treat by Dr. Desar, who will be joined by Sri Mati Chetna Madam to make present to make the present today's topic more interesting with conversation mode. After the presentation, we will have a teaching quiz on the topics covered by Sir by Sri Mati Rama Madam. Now it's shloka time, and Sri Mati Shamala is going to chant and explain that beautiful shloka from Shiva Paradakshma Pranastotra. We can also see this as the last stotra in Shiva Manasa Puja. Now I invite Shrimati Shamla Ma'am to explain Tara Charana Kritam Vakya Jam Karma Jam. Over to you, Shamla. Hari Om, Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. Tara Charana Kritam Vakya Jam Karma Jam Va Shravana Nayana Jam Va Manasam Va Paradam. क्षम स्वा जय जय करुणाब्धे श्री महादेव शंभो दिस श्लोक नेक्स्ट स्लाइड प्लीज दिस श्लोक इज फ्रॉम आदिशंकराचार्य शिव अपराध क्षमापण स्त्रोत्र एंड ऑल्सो फ्रॉम शिव मानस पूजा Before going to sleep, this prayer is recited. By this prayer, one asks the Lord for forgiveness for any inappropriate actions that one may have done knowingly or unknowingly during the day. We should be alert enough to realize our mistakes, regret doing the same, paschatapa, seek forgiveness, shama yachana, resolve never to repeat them. and do our best to compensate for the same by expiatory action prayaschitta now how do we commit sins next slide please kara charana krutam means whatever sins aparadham have been committed krutam by actions performed by my hands kara and sins with my feet charanabhyam kara charana नेक्स्ट वाक कायजम कर्मजम वाक मींस स्पीच मिस्टेक्स और सिंस बोर्न ऑफ माय स्पीच लाइक क्रिटिसाइजिंग अदर्स गॉसिपिंग अटरिंग अनट्रूज एंड हार्श वर्ड्स इंस्टेड ऑफ सिंगिंग हिज ग्लोरीज और अपराध माइट हैव हैपेंड थ्रू माय बॉडी कायजम काया मींस बॉडी एंड जम मींस कमिंग आउट और अपराध माय एक्शंस कर्मजम बाय माय एक्शंस कर्मजम सो करचरण कृतम वा कायजम कर्मजम वा नेक्स्ट श्रवण नयन जम वी डू रॉन्ग थ्रू श्रवण थ्रू आवर इयर्स व्हेन वी लिसन टू गॉसिप व्हेन वी इग्नोर गुड एडवाइस एंड डू नॉट लिसन टू द ग्लोरीज ऑफ गॉड सो मिस्टेक्स बाय श्रवण मिस्टेक्स प्रोड्यूस्ड बाय माय आईज nayana jam instead of seeing and appreciating the auspicious things shravana nayana jam va or manasam va paradham sins committed by my mind that is thoughts to think evil plot devious acts etc next slide please vihitam avihitam mistakes may happen while performing actions that are prescribed that is duties prescribed by shastras or allotted duties vihitam as well as all other actions which are not explicitly prescribed is avihitam that is prohibited actions vihitam avihitam we do wrong when we partially follow the ordained or do what is prohibited 
Sarvam etat kshamasva. Please forgive all these mistakes. Jaya Jaya Karunabde, Shri Mahadeva Shambhu. Victory. Victory to you, O Shri Mahadeva Shambhu. I surrender to you. You are an ocean of compassion. Next slide, please. Here, the devotee asks for complete forgiveness that covers all his sins and mistakes. Such forgiveness is possible only by God or by divine souls. It is only his compassion and his inherent divine nature that makes the Lord forgive us each time. Who would not worship such a great and compassionate Lord? May he always be victorious. Indeed, he alone is always victorious. May he shower his blessings on us always. Hari Om, Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. Thank you very much, Shamila, for introducing another wonderful prayer from Shiva Manasa Stotra. Sada Shiva Samarambham Shankara Charya Madhyamam Asmada Charya Pariyantam Ande Guru Paramparam Om. In today's Disha, we will be studying Gita chapter 13, verses 8 to 19, which cover the Jnanam portion and the Gnayam portion. Certainly, the Gnayam portion is perhaps one of the deepest in the entire Bhagavad Gita. The three main topics in the third shatkam of the Bhagavad Gita deal with Jivatma, Paramatma, Aikyam, or the essential oneness of all of us. And this is understood through the sadhana of Jnana Yoga. And another topic that comes right from the 13th, 14th, 15th chapter, 16th, 17th, is about the importance of values, which we will be studying in class today as Jnanam. I will reverse the topic. First, we will touch on Gnayam, because this is certainly a little difficult topic, and we will conclude by understanding what is Jnanam. What is Gnayam? Gnayam is that which is worth knowing. If we are a human being with a certain amount of intelligence and we are blessed with the presence of a guru, Manushutvam, Mumukshutvam, Mahapurusha. If these things are there, what is worth knowing? And that is what is called Gnayam. And Gnayam part is covered in the Bhagavad Gita in 13th chapter from verses 13 to 19. One of the greatest of uh, Vedantic, if I can say, realized Purushas, Bhagwan Ramana, had one question to all his seekers. Enquire who I am. It is said there was a small child who came to him with leukemia. And about 50, 60 years ago, there was no cure. And Bhagwan looked at the child and gave this mantra. This is a Maha Mantra. This mantra needs to be meditated upon. And the mantra goes like this. Naham deham oham soham. We can repeat it mentally again and again. Naham deham oham soham. What is the implication or the significance of this mantra? Bhagavan has condensed the essence of Gnayam, the essence of Vedantic wisdom in just these few words. Naham Deham. I am not my body. In this whole exercise of who am I, as long as I identify with my body, I have no doubt about who I am. From my date of birth and all my biodata, uh, my family tree, everything is very clear to me. But someone tells you that clearly you are not your body. Then we begin to inquire. And that process of inquiry, which is possible best with the presence of a guru and shastra, is called koham. Koham means to inquire. And when you inquire, hopefully, if our journey is successful, you will attain to saha aham asmi, which in Sanskrit is brought out in one word called soham. Saha means he, the big he, Bhagwan. Aham asmi, I am that. All our lives 
have been in the triangular format of what is called Jiva Jagat Ishwara. When I wake up in the morning, I recognize I am limited. I am small. I have so much problems in the world. I appeal to God to help me to go through all the difficulties that I expect to go through. And this is the triangular format. But when you come across great masters like Bhagwan Ramana, our own teacher, Swami Paramarthananda, and the whole school of Vedanta, they make you shift or they introduce you to what is called the binary format of changing your whole perspective of Atma and Anatma. If this is understood, the Gnayam portion will be understood. The Gnayam portion of the Bhagavad Gita becomes very clear only when a sadhaka is now ready to move from the triangular format, which we have been used to all our lives, to the binary format of Atma and Anatma. Atma means my real self, which is something other than the body. Anatma is everything that I can experience including my body and mind. This sadhana from, when you move from the triangular format to the binary format, what happens? The jiva, jagat, ishvara do not disappear. They continue to remain. But jiva, my body mind, jagat, the world around me, including ishvara whom I go to the temple and to my prayer room and pray, are reduced to mitya nam rupa. It is like a person discovering the water in the way, the water in the ocean is one and the same. The discovery of the gold in every ornament. This discovery is not a small discovery. When Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, he made a statement which has been often quoted, one small step for man, one giant step for mankind. This statement, naham, deham, poham, soham, appears to be a small statement, I am not my body. But if this statement is understood in letter and spirit, this is not an ordinary step. This is a landmark step. For a person, it is almost like, I can say, landing on the moon or going beyond that. It is a very, very significant step. It is the greatest step. This understanding that I am someone other than the body. I am not my body. Fortunately for us, earlier in this chapter, Sri Krishna had given this one statement. Meditate on this. These are statements for Nidityasana. That means I need to repeat this statement again and again. Shetragnyam chapi maam viddi sarvakshetreshu bhadaka. Vidhi, please know, Shri Krishna says, Vidhi, you must know what Shetragnyam, the one who is listening, the one who is seeing through your eyes. What is that power that makes me conscious? What is that power which enlivens me? And Shri Krishna says, know to be me. The Shri Krishna principle, which we call Parabrahman, the consciousness principle, Atma, Brahman, all these are synonymous. And that principle which is speaking in me is the same one listening in you and the same one in every creature and in every material being also. And Sri Krishna concludes in the same verse, this knowledge, Shetra, Shetra, Gnya, Yor, Jnanam, that distinction, Yat Jnanam, Yat Tat Jnanam, Matam Mama, Matam in my opinion, that is the real knowledge. This is what is called Nayam. Before we go to Nayam, part of today's topic is to be very clear what Swamiji again and again wants us to know as the fundamental laws of Vedanta, which is very similar to Naham, Deham, Poham, Soham. The first fundamental law is I am not my body, which is a little more extension. I am different from whatever I experience. I experience the world around me. I experience my body. I experience my mind. Therefore, I am not my body. I am not my mind. And it is very clear that I am not anything that I experience. The first fundamental principle can really be brought out to I am not my body mind. Second, all attributes that I experience. For example, I'm seeing something black. 
you may be able to see this mouse that I'm holding is black. Now, black is an attribute. This attribute belongs to the object of my experience. It is, it is not an attribute that belongs to me. Very easy. What does it mean? It means as Atma, I am Nirguna. I have no attributes. And if you dissect into it, this understanding can be an enlightening, uh, a transformative experience. Let me go slowly. The fundamental law says this, I am not my body, I am not my mind, then what am I? I am the witness of my body and mind. I function through this body and mind. My body mind serves as an instrument. I am that consciousness principle that enlivens this body and functions through this body. And this is a Mahavakya, I am Atma Brahma. And what is my nature? I have no attributes in time. That means I am Nitya in Sanskrit. I have been there from the very beginning. If there is a beginning, I will be there till the very end. If there is an end, I have no beginning, no end. This itself can be a very great experience. Whenever these great, uh, uh, these asuras, they do a great sadhana and they go to Brahmaji and Lord Shiva and they get boons. The only boon they ask is, I want to be immortal. Now, Sri Krishna is saying, you are already that. You are Nitya. I seem to be located or functioning through this body because the body is a medium of, in, medium of uh, interaction. But I am all-pervading. I, as Atma, am all-pervading. Just like the cellular space is everywhere, but it functions through my phone. The message that I get is actually everywhere but it is picked up from my receiver. See how you can understand that. I seem to be limited to this body, but I am not limited by the body. That is my true nature. And this is another Mahavakya that comes from the Mandukya Upanishad. I am Atma Brahma. We began our journey as Viveka. Viveka means to have a clear discrimination. And Viveka is of three types. The three types are called Satta Sat Viveka. That which is there in all three periods of time is called Sat. That which disappears when, I am in, when I'm dreaming or in deep sleep is Asat. And therefore, this body, mind, and this world come under the domain of Asat. The observer of my dream, the one who says I slept well, the one who is observing this waking state, that is called Sat that which is there in all three periods of time. So there is somebody in me who has observed my dream, who knows I slept well, who is awake right now and saying that I'm speaking to you. That entity is of the nature of Sat, which is there in all three periods of time. And this is what, when you say, I am the am aspect, then there is a conscious individual. I know I am conscious because I can experience this world. I'm an experiencer. That experience is called Chit, and therefore you can say, I am. The third Viveka is called Sukadukka Viveka. When you say that I am Sat and I am Chit, and then when you realize my true nature is actually limitless, because as I already said, I have no limitations in time, I have no limitations in space, I have no limitations as far as this body is concerned. The body is limited, not limited. And therefore, I am ananta, limitless. And when I experience my limitlessness, I experience my true nature as ananda. And therefore, I am satchit ananda. Why do we suffer samsara? Because we are not aware of this fact that I am satchit ananda. This knowledge that I am satchit ananda is also called gnayam. In this chapter, it is called purusha. In this chapter, it is called shetragnya. We have not understood these things. We have not understood that we are a mixture of body, mind, complex, and atma. We tend to identify with the body, mind part as though it is the real I. And we suffer the limitations of the body, mind as my limitations. And therefore, the whole purpose of this part of the Bhagavad Gita, the Niyam portion, is to have atma and atma viveka. As body, mind, remember one thing. There is no permanent solution to any problem. You solve one problem today, you land into another problem. As Atma, 
there is no problem. So this Viveka makes all the difference. Now, the aim of Vedanta, the way, aim of the name portion of the Vedanta is to train our minds to claim the Atma as the real I, the body-mind as a means for interaction for the Vyavahara. Like a role play, see this world as a stage, play your roles and all the time claim I am, name, I am Shetragnya. With this background, let us understand these uh, important verses, starting with verse 13. Chetana, please. Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. So from verse 13 up to 19, Shri Krishna takes up the topic of Niyam, which means that which is to be known by everyone. It is the same as Chetragnya. And Krishna gives an introduction here in this 13th verse. He says, Neyam yat tat pravakshyami yat nyatva amritam ashnute anadimat param brahma na sat asat tat asat uchyate. He says, Pravakshyami, I will tell you yat tat neyam about that which is to be known. Yat nyatva, knowing which ashnute you will attain amritam immortality. So, what is to be known by all? He says, Tat Param Brahma. That ultimate thing to be known is called Brahman. And what is its nature? It is Anadimat, that which does not have a beginning. So it is limitless and Anantam. And Na Sat Tat Na Asat Uchyate. Brahman is neither the cause nor the effect. It has no form, no attribute and no time. Therefore, it is not a concept to be conceived. Krishna here is bringing in the essence of the Upanishads, the Upanishad Sara. Let us look at this opening verse of the Gnayam portion. Shri Krishna begins as always in a very powerful manner. Nayam yatat pravakshami yat nyatva amritam ashnute. He straight away says, I'm going to teach you about Nayam. And if you know about Nayam, amritat Ashnute, you will attain to immortality. Now, I will tell you something. You are seated wherever you are. And I will tell you, I will tell you something. Once you know and once you have understood what I have said, you will become the richest man in the world. Now, you, you don't have to do anything. You have to be just there. How is it possible that, that I'm going to tell you something? Just I'm giving you an information. And how is that my information or that knowledge that I'm going to give you can make you the richest person in the world? This is possible only under one condition. If you are already the richest person in the world, but for some reason you are ignorant of the fact. I know you are the richest person in the world. And when I convince you in my own way that you are the richest person in the world by giving you your facts, whatever that you are, this is how knowledge can bring about a transformation. And what is this knowledge that brings about a transformation? This consciousness, which is also called Nayam, has to be claimed as the real me. And when I claim that, I can exclaim that Mahavakya Aham Brahmasmi. I have no limitations in time. I have no limitations in space. All our problems are because of limitations. I have no limitations whatsoever. Although as body-mind, I know I have limitations. But then I know through my new real nature, I am Amritam. I am immortal. Chetana, please. The 14th verse. Sarvata Pani Padam Tat Sarvato Akshi Shiro Mukham Sarvata Shruti Malloke Sarvam Avritya Tishtati. Krishna says Tat, that Brahman, the existence principle, Sarvada Pani Padam has got hands and legs everywhere, meaning it pervades everywhere. Sarvato Akshi Shiro Mukham, that Sat Brahman has got Akshi, eyes, Shira, heads, Mukham, mouths everywhere. And Sarvata Shruti Mat Loke. It is everywhere with countless years, Shruti, in this universe, Loke. In short, 
sarvam avritya tishtati it remains pervading surrounding everything so wherever you look you are looking at god vishwarupa ishvara each of these verses have an ordinary meaning the word meaning has been explained and we have understood the word meaning and that is called the vacharta we have got the regular word meaning but the teacher will reveal to you what is called the lakshartha what is the implied meaning word meaning sounds ridiculous that brahman suddenly brahman is made an object which of course i have to claim as the consciousness within me and shri krishna says that brahman has got hands and legs and head and eyes everywhere it is everywhere that brahman is can be seen as ishwarupa ishvara that brahman is all pervading to understand this part the gnayam portion of the bhagavad gita two words are very important and if you understand these two words this kind of shift from vachyartha to lakshartha becomes meaningful otherwise we don't get the deeper meaning we don't get the hidden meaning what madhusudana saraswati called gudartha the hidden meaning now brahman is everywhere means brahman should be in me also brahman should be outside me and brahman should be inside me that which is very imminent that which is very close to me that which is in and through for example space is outside me space is inside me space can be said to be imminent it is very immediate it is very close to me and yet space or light for example the light on my hand is not affected by anything dirt on my hand and that which is not affected by anything is called transcendental so this brahman or this consciousness this kshetragnyam chapi mam vidhi sarva kshetreshu bharatam it is everywhere it is here it is there it is everywhere and therefore the vishwarupa ishvara darshana is a preparation to be able to see this gnayam brahman or this kshetragnya in me is there outside me always the bhagavad gita is poetry and poetry can convey something which words cannot convey and therefore we have to look for what i said is called the not the vachyartha but what is the hidden meaning or the lakshya artha this is a verse from the taitri upanishad uh, which goes like this yato vacho nivartante aprapya manasa sa this part the gnayam portion the whole upanishadic portion the whole description of brahman is something that cannot be described in words it cannot be understood in the mind it comes very beautifully in one upanishad called the kena upanishad and that is why swami anubhavananda calls it the sugar kena upanishad because it is so sweet in its way it teaches you so much about yourself there is a dialogue between the teacher and the student when the teacher is struggling to indicate to the student and then the teacher says it is not something that i can teach you because it is not an object see when something is existing and it is not an object it can be the subject isn't it it can be you so the teacher was trying to teach something which is not an object and then he says uh it cannot be described in words it cannot be understood in the mind but then don't worry it cannot be taught like you teach medical science or any other science but then he says don't worry my teacher has taught me in a certain peculiar way and somehow i have been able to understand it now i will teach you in the same way and so the same parampara goes on what cannot be described in words but cannot be understood in the mind it cannot be taught but can be caught and that is why in this parampara in this tradition the guru shastra proximity is so important proximity does not mean physical proximity the proximity is an understanding when you are on the same wavelength none of us have had teachers in the same room our teachers were always audios listening to swami paramatma nandaji 
uh, recorded some time ago, and yet his words have made sense to us. When we come to the domain of knowledge, there are three things, three words to be known. One is called the unknown, the other is called the known, and the third is called the unknowable. What is unknown? There are many things I do not know. But then if I use a correct means of knowledge, maybe if I can go to chat GPT or if I can go to Google, I will get to know. I can go to the internet and find out so many things. So there are some parts of the world or some aspects which I do not know. But if I can Google and find out, I will get to know. But there is something which is unknowable because it is not an object. Why? It may be, it could be the subject. It could be my true self. Chetana, please. Shri Krishna continues. Sarvendriya guna bhasam, sarvendriya vivarjitam, asaktam sarva brachaiva, nirgunam guna bhoktrutcha. He says, this existence is all the time appreciated by us through all the sense organs. Therefore, he says, Sarva Indriya Guna Bhasa means the existence of Brahman is manifest, Abhasa, through every sensory operation, Sarva Indriya Guna. At the same time, Sarva Indriya Vivarjitam, Brahman is free from all the sense organs or objects. That means that they are not the intrinsic nature of Brahman. Instead, Sarva Brachaiva, this existence Brahman accommodates and supports everything. It is the Sarva Adharam. But it is Asaktam, it is free from all the objects of the world. And Guna Bhoktra means it is associated with all the properties, but at the same time without properties. So Nirgunam. You see again the difficulty for a teacher to convey, and that is why when these Upanishads were being translated. The Bhagavad Gita is the essence of all Upanishads. It was being translated by Western scholars who have not gone through this tradition. They say they were these are pracklings of an immature mind. I mean, they thought these are poetic descriptions of a person who is not in a senses because he's talking something absolutely irrational. Certainly, they may not appeal to a rational mind, but they are supra-rational. Of all the verses, this uh, Sarvendriya Guna Basan is one of the most beautiful verses in the entire Bhagavad Gita. And of course, because I had a chance to explain this verse during the verse to verse classes, it is one of my most favorite verses. Let us look into this line Sarvendriya Guna Abhasam. Through every sensory interaction, I am seeing, and I'm seeing so many things around me. What am I seeing through every experience, whether it's Shabda, Sparsha, Rupa, Rasa, Ganda, through all my sense organs and through my mind, what is manifest all the time is none other than him, if I can put it as third person, or Brahman. That means there is something outside. But that's something because of my sense organs, I'm able to experience within me, just like if I show you my hand, and ask you, in addition to my hand, is there something else? You will see there is light on my hand. So all these objects have light on them, and therefore I'm seeing them. And that light is seen in my eye, and that light is seen in my mind, and the mind is seen through the light of my consciousness. So whatever is existent outside is directs me to the consciousness inside. And in the Keno Upanishad, the same verse, Sarvendriya Guna Basam, is brought out as prati bodha viditam matam. That means in every experience, I come in touch with the experiencer. I see the existent world outside, Vishwarupa, Ishwara outside. I become aware of the Brahman as consciousness within me. Savarvendra vivarjitam. Now comes the paradoxical phase. Although it is manifest through every sense organs, it has no relationship to any sense organs because why it is asakta it is of a higher order compared to my body mind and the higher order and the lower order have no interactions at the same time sarva brichaiva it is just like the dreamer is supporting the dream the dreamer supports the entire dream it is nirguna but guna bhoktricha that means 
because of him, I'm able to see the black, I'm able to see all the attributes. I'm saying him, which is actually consciousness within me. Now, once you get all these verses and once the teacher has given you a certain meaning, the deeper meaning, the good artha, the hidden meaning, then what do you do? You memorize these words. Sarvendriya guna basin. Sarvendriya vivarjitam asaktam sarva vrichaiva nirgunam guna bhoktricha hundred times in a day. Let this go on. And after some time when you meditate more deeper, just take the first line. Sarvendriya guna basin. To every sense organs, he is manifest. He is manifest both there and here. He is manifest outside as existence. He is manifest internally as consciousness. This is Nidityasana. Our teacher uses these opportunities to tell us what is called Adhyaropa Apavada. Adhyaropa Apavada is a method used by Vedantic teachers to tell you Brahma Satyam Jagannathya. Extremely difficult to accept that this body mind is not real, this world around me is not real, but the teacher wants to tell you that the consciousness within me is the only reality, everything else is of a lower order of reality. And in order to do that, there is a method of what is called superimposition you superimpose and then you take it out. Example, now if you have to build a, uh, if you have to build any structure, you have to build a, scaf a scaffold. This is the methodology employed by Vedanta to bring up a particular truth. Just like you produce a scaffold and then put the roof and then remove the scaffold. So Adhyaropa is superimposition, Apavada is negation of the superimposition. I'll give you an example. This is a popular example. For example, there is light all over in this room, but we are not able to uh, appreciate it unless I put my hand in front and fold. And then I put my hand across and say, uh, are you able to see my hand? And then ask you, how are you able to see my hand? Because there is light on my hand. So the teacher has revealed the light, which was otherwise not seen. Then the teacher withdraws the hand. Introducing the hand is called Adhyarupa. Removal of the hand is called Apavada. Now I know even if the hand is not there, the light is always there. Now, as I said, this is a method to introduce Brahma Satyam Jagannitya. And how do we do that? Now, we have to introduce uh, you know, we have to introduce the creation and to be able to say the creation is none other than Brahman itself. Just like uh, whenever you see a, 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 when you see a pot and what do you see in that pot? The pot is none other than clay. And then you say that pot is only the name and form. This whole world is Brahman with Nama and Rupa. And then you, although you remove the pot and you have revealed the clay, so too we have to remove creation and to reveal Brahman. I do not know how else to teach it, but see, when you learn, whenever you go to a teacher and learn, the teacher can give you 25% by giving you highlighting what is it to learn. When you study it yourself, the teaching becomes 50%. Now you teach it to somebody else. You're teaching, now you become distinction. You reach 75%. Then over a period of time, the teaching was internalized within you and it becomes 100%. So all I can do is 25% and say there is something called Adhya Ropa, that what hand and light example. All this is done by, because we need to say my body, my mind, my profession, and my family, which I give a lot of importance to. In Sanskrit, it is called Aham. Uh, ahankara and mamakara are the source of all our problems in our life because we identify with the growing, growing, growing body mind. And therefore, at some stage, if this mayam part reveals in your life, 
my life becomes transformed. Then my, I know my body, my, I have lived in so many bodies and therefore what happens to my body cannot have happened to me. It cannot affect me really. My life may be slowed down. My experience of pain may be there because I have a pain body. But I am Nandati, Nandati, Nandateva because I cannot be affected by any of the limitations of my mind. In business, we know all these things. If we want to make an investment, we invest on something that is going to last for a long time. And what do we, are we going to invest in this body-mind or are we going to invest in the Atma? In the Manisha Panchakam, there is a very powerful verse, verse 3, which again I love very much. It says, Sashvan Nashwara Neva Vishwa Makelam Nishchitya Vatya Guru Sashvan Nashwaram Eva Vishwam Akilam it is possible and we do see that the whole world around us is perishing constantly, maybe sometimes in, to a great extent. So remember, the world is growing, growing and going. Don't invest too much. Nityam Brahma Nirantara. There is something permanent. Nirvaja Shantatmana. Chetana, please. Verse 16. Bahir Antascha Bhutanam Acharam Charat Mevacha Sukshmatvat Tad Avigneyam Durastamcha Antike Chatat. Bahir Antascha, this Brahman is Bahi outside the body as well as inside Antaha. Acharam Charam Evacha, it is moving as well as unmoving. Durastamcha Antike Chatat, that Brahman is far away, Durastam and Antike. It is near. So Brahman is far and near. What does that mean? Shankaracharya gives a, an interpretation. According to him, for a wise person, Brahman is nearest because he knows that Brahman is not away from me. For an ignorant person, Brahman is far away because he is still searching. But if Brahman is everywhere, why do I not recognize that Brahman? Because Krishna says it is sukshma. It is of the subtlest nature, which means that it is free from all attributes. It is attributes alone that help me recognize things. And therefore, it is a vigneyam, extremely difficult to comprehend. These are paradoxical verses and you will see them all the time in all the Upanishads. I have chosen one verse from the Isha Vasi Upanishad, which speaks about the same thing. Tadejati tanejati taddure tadantike tadantarasya sarvasya tad sarvasya vahyataha. It moves, it does not move. It is far, it is near, it is inside, it is outside. So this is a paradox. This can be understood not by word meaning, but not through vachyartra, but through lakshatra, through the implied meaning. The implied meaning is understood if you know what is this immanent and transcendental. It is very, very close to me. And yet, it is something of a higher order. And therefore, Brahman being all-pervading, it cannot move. But when I move, I am a reflection of Brahman. Brahman seems to move. And therefore, because of the existence of objects, it appears to be both inside, it appears to be outside. But these are very relative terms. Uh, and therefore, continue, please. Avik bhaktam cha bhuteshu vibhaktim iva chastitham bhuta bhartricha tat neyam grasisnu prabha vishnu cha. Brahman is avibhaktam, it is undivided. And at the same time, vibhaktam, it is seemingly divided in all beings. God's existence is as though divided among all that exist in this world. It is Prabha Vishnu, means it is sustains by giving existence to the world. So it is Srishti Karanam. It is Grasisnu, literally means the swallower or destroyer. So it is Laya Karanam. And it is Bhuta Bhratracha, means it is a sustainer, Stiti Karanam. So one God with many roles. There is a beautiful word uh, describing Brahman as Akanda. We have that Akanda. Akanda mandala karam akanda, that which cannot be divided, just like space cannot be divided, but yet we divide spaces, my airspace and your airspace and so on. 
So this division is a seeming division. At the same time, Brahman is the creator, sustainer, and destroyer. Just like I create my dream, I sustain my dream, and when I wake up, the dream resolves into me. And that is what these words are describing. And finally, we come to the second last verse. Uh, Chetana, please. Jyotisham apita jyoti tamasa pramachut parama uchate jnanam gneyam jnana gamyam ridhi sarvasya vishtitam. Shri Krishna says, Jyotisham api jatad jyoti. It is the light of all lights. Param tamasa uchyate. This light of consciousness is a unique light with which you can illumine or know even darkness or ignorance. Tamasa. So jnanam neyam and jnana gamyam. And through this knowledge, this brahma jnanam, you will find that neyam, the object of knowledge and the goal of knowledge, jnana gamyam, is all the same. Therefore, the knower is Brahman, the knowing instrument is Brahman, the known object is Brahman, and the destination you want to reach ultimately is also Brahman. In short, Sarvam Brahma Mayam Jagat. And where is it? Sarvasya Ridhi Vishtitam, abiding in the hearts of all. This Gneam portion culminates in another most beautiful verse, Jyoti Sham, that Abhi Jyoti. The word Jyoti Sham Jyoti can be taken as Deva Deva. Deva Deva means the light of all lights. That's why Shiva is called Mahadeva. Deva, one meaning is sense organs. The sense organs are able to see because I'm able to see because of the sense organs. The sense organs are able to function because of Shetragnyam Chapi Mahamuddhi, because of the Shri Krishna principle, because of consciousness. And therefore, that Shri Krishna principle or Gnayam is called Mahadeva or the light of all lights. It can also be called Vasudeva, Vasati, that which exists. Deva means light. So this is not an ordinary light. This is an extraordinary light. And this light can illumine even darkness because normal light, like the sun, cannot illumine darkness. But this light of consciousness can illumine some things that I do not know. For example, I do not know Russian. But I know, I do not know. So everywhere you will see this. For example, in the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, it begins with the consciousness principle, verse 20, Ahamatma guna guda kesha. And it, it concludes by, uh, I lend existence to everything in verse 39. And uh, that is how the Gnayam portion also concludes. There is another very difficult part to understand. Uh, this portion, which I would have to say, jnanam, gneyam, jnana gamyam. Difficult to explain. But then we have to know in every interaction, there are three things. Interaction means in Vyavahara. That means the original Parabrahma, Paramatma, now divides into three. It divides into the object of my experience, the knower of the object of experience, and the process of knowing. The knower in me, because of my body-mind, there is a limited knower called the Brahmata. I'm experiencing who is this? It is not Brahman. Brahman, through this body-mind and through the body-mind, there is an image of the whole world around me. And that limited knower is called Brahmata. This is possible because of a certain instrument through this body-mind that is called Pramanam. And whatever I experience is called Brahmeyam. And this Jyoti Sham Apitat Jyoti is Jnanam, Niyam, Jnana Gamyam. It is the Pramata, it is the Pramanam, it is the Prameya. It is simply everything. And then Shri Krishna concludes this beautiful portion by saying, Iti Shetram Tata Jnanam. We'll come back to Jnanam now. Niyam Choktam Sama Sataha. I have briefly told you everything. But who will be able to understand? Mad Bhaktaha. You have to be my devotee. And if you are able to understand Savigneyaha, you not only Vigneyaha, you will know it clearly. You become Vigneyaha and Madhbhava Upadayate, you will become one with me. So I have taught this very briefly. And if you are my devotee, and that's why Bhakti is an important qualification, you will attain to the same nature as my nature. Now we come to the 
earlier portion, that is the portion between 8 to 13 in five verses, Shri Krishna has described 20 values which will help us in our spiritual growth. And if you want success, then this is an option for us. This is actually the elaboration of the five yamas and the five niyamas. Chetana, please. Most of us at one time or the other have felt we are not making any progress in spite of following all the prescribed sadhanas. Have we hit a spiritual roadblock? And why is that? So Sri Krishna here talks about the fine tuning and changes we need to make in our personality so that a spiritual journey is smooth and the destination is reached without any roadblocks. To successfully achieve this primary goal, a person must adjust his lifestyle accordingly and it must align with his goal. So from verses 8 to 12, Krishna lists 20 values which are conducive for Vedantic study. So though all the values are important, we'll highlight only a few here. Krishna mentions three values that we need to cultivate, which convey the same idea, but at three different levels. They are Amanitvam, which is freedom from conceit at the thought level. Anahamkara, freedom from conceit at the verbal level. And Adhambitvam, freedom from conceit at the physical or the action level. What happens when our expectations are not met? We resort to violence. So another important value is ahimsa, non-violence at physical, verbal, and mental levels. Now, if ahimsa has to be followed, then another value called shanti is required. And what is shanti? Means forbearance and patience. It provides resistance to the disturbances of the mind when expectations are not fulfilled. fulfilled. That is why it is an extension of ahimsa. There are two aspects to shanti. One is titiksha, which means the act acceptance without resistance of situations that we have no control over. And shama, although we cannot change the past, we do have the capacity to change the future. If one does not develop titiksha and shama, he will have stress and strain in his life. Then Krishna says we need arjavam, uprightness or alignment of the physical, verbal and mental faculties of the personality. That is, think, say and do the same thing. So satyam is a subset of arjavam. Krishna emphasizes worship of the teacher, acharya upasanam, as very important for a spiritual seeker. Why? Because... Self-knowledge that we seek can be acquired only through the Shastras and the Shastras can be understood only through with the help of a Guru. Therefore, worship or reverence towards the teacher is an important virtue for the students of Vedanta. Then the spiritual pursuit requires both external and internal purity. So Shaucham is an important value to cultivate. One will also face obstacles. It may be actual or imaginary when pursuing any goal. The person with sthairyam or perseverance is one who continues his pursuit despite these obstacles. But unless we have self-mastery over the body, mind and sense organs, spiritual pursuit will not be a success. Therefore, we also need atma vinigraha, which means self-mastery or self-management. Atma here means the body and Ashtanga Yoga is meant for this purpose. Mere body orientation will cause obstruction to spiritual progress. It must also be remembered that it is only a means and not the end. So one must understand the problems of the body to be able to give up the attachment to it. Krishna calls this Janma Mrityu Jara Vyadi Dukkha Dosha Anudarshana. We also have to develop asakti, non-attachment or detachment towards our child, children, spouse, house, etc. This is Anahabhiv Sangha, Putra Dara, Brahadishu. Krishna says, by not getting lost in the company of people and seeking quietude, arati janasamsadi, constant self-enquiry, adhyatma jnana nityatvam, and with ananya yogena bhakti, unswerving devotion, one will know the benefit of and value of jnana tattva, jnanartha darshanam. He says these virtues together with the study of shastras constitute jnanam. 
anything opposite to these virtues is Agnana. Hariyo. Thank you very much, Chetana, for summarizing all this. Now, here comes if I know what is wrong, but I'm not able to correct it, Swamiji gives us a five point formula. First is called Viveka. Through Viveka, tell us if I am, you know, the more aware I am, the less likely I'm able to do something wrong. Sankalpa, I make a resolution that I'm not going to do that again. Pratipaksha Bhavana, do something if I have a miserly tenderness, become more and more generous. And of course, it is satsanga and prarthana. And hopefully with this five-point formula, we are able to get that jnanam, which helps us to get jnaya. To conclude this whole presentation, what is the remedy for samsara? It is through spiritual knowledge. And what part of spiritual knowledge? This gnayam portion, also called shetra, shetra, jnaya, vibhaga, or drik, drishya, viveka. I'll repeat. If knowledge, if ignorance and wrong identification is the problem, the remedy is through right knowledge and right ident identification. The knowledge that I should know that the word I has got two components. One is the body, mind, the lower I, the transactional I, the higher is the Atma. And this distinction is called Shetra, Shetra, Jnya, Vibha. I have to train my mind to claim the higher I and allow my body, mind to play its role as body, mind. Uh, is a lower part and I to see this whatever role I have play that role to convert life into a play because the world is a stage and all the time claiming my higher nature this is the only solution if I do that will I get moksha the teacher will understand that I will know that I have never been a samsari I have always been free my struggle for moksha will end claiming that Atma or the Sakshi is my true nature, is the aim of all Vedanta. And therefore, you understand that the consciousness within me and existence outside me is one and the same. And such a person is able to silently claim, I am that, Aham Brahma Asmi. Aryom Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. We now have a teaching quiz conducted by Ramaji uh, on these important verses. Rama, madam. Hari Om, Sri Guru Pyonamaha. Today we have learned about Nanam and Gnayam from our Guru Dr. Higdesar and Chetana Madam. Uh, the verses from 8 to 12 of this chapter cover Gnanam considered as stage one to attain self knowledge. 20 virtues mentioned are synonyms for Gnanam without which Gnanam is impossible. These virtues are at kaikam physical level, manasikam the intellectual level, and vachikam at the speech level. Always they have to be practiced simultaneously at all levels by this seeker. Now let us try to answer a few questions based on these verses that we study today for better understanding. Now uh, fill in the blanks. Adam Bitvam is Freedom from conceit at the dash level. Uh, I think, yes, madam. I think it's yeah. uh, the Kaika level. Yes, yes, you are right. Asatihi is freedom from dash. Uh, it must be a mental attachment. Yeah, attachment is always mental. So it can be only attachments. The answer can be only attachments. Okay. Anabhishwangaha is freedom from? Um, it must be sort of deeper attachments towards uh, uh, near and dear ones. Hmm. Yes, yes, exactly. Atma vinigraha is freedom from? Uh, is it uh, indiscipline or something like that? Okay, indiscipline or indulgence also is okay. Indulgence. Vairagyam is freedom from? Uh, it's uh, freedom from passion towards yes. uh, and so Yeah, worldly objects, okay. Vivitta desha sevitvam is freedom from? Uh, some uh, crowded place or something like that. Yeah, busy place, yeah, you are right. Then moving on to the verse number nine, 
the words indriyartheshu vairagyam in the verse nine convey dispassion towards sense objects an objective attitude of neither likes nor dislikes not aversion to objects all of the above okay i'm a little confused i think it's uh, all of the above it is it yes right? yes exactly yes you are right so the, so so far we have studied about the gnanam and it is a means of gnayam it is the second stage it is the stage 2 for god realization the word gnayam means that which is to be known that is brahman as the gita dhyana shloka says sarvopanishado gavo dogdha gopala nandana shri krishna brings out the essence of all the upanishads as he describes the gnayam in the verses 13 to 19 six aspects of brahman are identified through these verses namely omnipotence omniscience partlessness that is asangaha timelessness kalatitaha omnipresence and self effulgence referring to shloka 13 the word brahma means the infinite one what does the word infinite imply here uh, is it uh, free from the threefold uh, limitation that is desha kala uh, vastu vastu yeah space, time yes. and attribute or vastu okay objects so here the brahman the absolute is to be known by all to cross over mortality brahman is beyond the domain of cause and effect the difference between karanam and karyam is determined by kala therefore whatever is beyond karya karana is kalatitam and it is anantatva that is anantatva of para brahman and in the verse same verse 13 the words sat and asat shows that brahman is karanam karyam karyam and karanam karyam and karana vilakshana uh, is it uh, d karyam karana vilakshana yes yes exactly so here shri krishna says that brahman is beyond the relative terms of existence and non existence it is neither sat the karanam nor asat the karyam in this context the word sat means karanam or unmanifested which is potentially existent asat means karyam or manifested one karyam is as good as existence because it is available for our transactions in the verse 14 what feature of brahman does the word sarvataha indicate sarvataha Uh, sarvataha means uh, uh, he is the witness that is all pervasive uh, sarva gataha all pervasive yes yes brahman is sarva gataha that is all pervasive he is the witness of all that occurs in the three worlds that is the, his manifestation he is both the fundamental substance and the nama roopa functions like the gold in every golden ornament similarly the universe as isness is the sub feature of brahman it is the essence of mahavakyam stated in chandogya upanishad sarvam khalvidam brahma meaning brahman is everywhere now in the next uh, shloka shri krishna says that uh, the brahman is omniscient the shweta shwatara upanishad mantra states apani pado javano grahita pashyat yachakshuhu so which are the words that supports that support this shruti vakyam in this verse okay we just heard dr hegde sir yes 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 sarvendriya guna bhasam and uh, sarvendriya vivarjitam yes sarvendriya guna bhasam means he manifests the functions of the senses and sarvendriya vivarjitam is he perceives the sense objects just as light is recognized existence is also recognized in in and through every sensory perception so brahman is omniscient as existence in everything then the ishopanishad mantra tadejati tannai jati that describes brahman 
practically in the same manner as Sri Krishna has described in the verse 16. Here, acharam charamevacha means Brahman is moving and non-moving also. What is the intent of this statement, Suti Vakya? Yeah, I think uh, it means it's uh, seemingly moving. It's really not uh, moving, non-moving. It is uh, yes. seemingly moving. Is Why do you it? think it is seemingly moving? Okay. It is really non-moving, but it is seemingly moving because when the, when the medium moves, it seems or it feels as if it is moving. Yeah, they all, uh, they all uh, uh, pervading light in a hall does not move at all. When I am moving the hand, there is a feeling of movement of light. Property of anatma being transferred to atma. This is called dharma adhyasa. Okay. And is extensively discussed in Vedarta. Okay. Now, uh, in the verse 17, Bhuteshu vibhaktam ivachasthitam. It remains undivided. Yet it appears as if divided in beings. Why is it seemingly divided? Mm, this consciousness is always all pervading that we know. But uh, yes. we experience it only where the body medium is available. Yes, exactly. Like uh, the space may seem to be divided among the objects that it contains. Yet all objects are within the one entity called space. It is just like that. And from the same uh, verse, we have another question. The Srimad Bhagavatam states, Vasudeva Paro Brahman. That is, Vasudeva is the ultimate and he is the Shushti Siti Laya Karta. Which part of the shloka reveals that Neyam is Rushti Siti Laya Karta? Okay. We just heard Chetana Madam about this. Uh, it yeah. is Tagneyam, uh, that Brahman is a Bhuta Bhartru Grasishnu Prabha Vishnu. Yes, exactly. Prabha Vishnu means Rushti Karanam, the creator. Prabhavaha means Utpattihi and Shnu means the cause for everything. Bhuta Bharta, the sustaining principle for all things and beings. Grasishnu means Laya Karanam. Literally, Grasishnu means the swallower, the uh, dissolution ground for everything. Just as the ocean throws up waves and then absorbs them back, the Ishvara creates the world, sustains and absorbs back into himself. Therefore, he is considered as the creator, sustainer and annihilator of everything. So Brahman is Kala Titaha because he is beyond Shushti, Siti and Laya. Then moving on to the 18th, it is the essence of Kathopanishad Mantra, Tameva Bhanta Manubhati Sarvam Tasya Bhasa Sarva Midam Vibhati. Which part of this shloka gives the same idea as this Shruti Vakya? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Hegde sir just explained about this. Jyoti Shamapi Tad Jyotihi. Tamasaha Paramuchyate. Yes. He is the source of light. Uh, in all the libraries. Yeah. In this verse, Sri Krishna establishes the supremacy of Brahman as Chit, the consciousness. The luminosity of the sun and the moon is borrowed from Paranjyoti Rupi Paramatma. In Vedanta, light means that in whose presence things are known and recognized. Even though every instrument of knowledge is light, the ultimate light is the consciousness principle. It makes every means of knowledge meaningful. And uh, uh, today's last verse is shloka number 19. Here in the last part, it says, what does Madhavaya Upapadyate indicate? Yes, I think it's uh, Sri Krishna is assuring, that is, uh, he assures the devotees attain his own nature, divine nature. Yes. What is his uh, divine nature? Satchidananda Swarupaha. Okay. Yes. This is the Amrutatvam that mentioned, that is mentioned in the verse 30. This sloka is the essence of few Upanishads. Mundaka Upanishad mantra states, Upasate purusham ye shakamaste shukrameta tativartanti dhiraha. 
those who engage in bhakti towards supreme purusha escape the cycle of birth and death shweta ashvatara upanishad also states yasya deve para bhakti hi yatha deve tatha guru those who have unflinching bhakti towards god and guru the imports of vedic scriptures automatically reveal to them the realized person experiences brahman which is explained in mundaka upanishad mantra brahmai veda amrutam brahmai veda amrutam purastat brahma paschat brahma that means it states that a realized person experiences that brahman alone everywhere this shloka also indicates sadhana chatushtaya sampatti as shown in the slide moving on to the tatva bodha topic the laws of vedanta there are two laws the first law states that experienced objects are different from the experience based on this please answer this question kshetram is not the consciousness principle the experienced world the body mind complex modifications of the mind and all of the above kshetram is not uh, the consciousness principle yes you are right the experiencer the atma is kshetragnaha and kshetram the experienced world and both are different okay. and the next question is the atma is not chaitanyam that which enlivens the three bodies kshetram experiencer and kshetragnaha kshetram kshetram okay. yes all others are mean the uh, uh, brahman itself okay. the second law of vedanta can be appreciated answering this question the experienced attributes does not belong to the objects the consciousness the modifications of the mind the 20 virtues mentioned in the 13th chapter of gita all of the above yes it, uh, attributes does not belong to the consciousness very good very good now to conclude in the verse 19 shri krishna consolidates his teachings so far he has discussed four topics namely kshetram kshetragnaha gnanam and gneya this satchit brahman alone is in the form of everything experienced in this universe realizing brahman happens in four stages gnanam the means of knowledge is the first stage and it can be equated to shravanam gneyam the goal of knowledge is the second stage and is mananam yearning for god is mumukshatvam is the stage 3 getting freed from the bondage of samsara is the stage 4 for god realization stages 3 and 4 comprise nididhyasanam which we study in the rest of the bhagavad gita the gnanis realize nirguna brahman the attribute aspect of brahman the devotee is worship the attribute aspect of aspect as saguna brahma residing within the body the same is known as paramatma all these are manifestations of the same supreme reality it supports the statement sarvam brahmamayam jagat so thus the basic vedanta teaching jeeva jagat ishvara bandha moksha and the sadhanas are explained from the verses 8 to 19 of 13th chapter hari om thank you shri guru bhyo namaha thank you rama madam and meenakshi for a very interesting quiz on one of the very difficult topics thank you ekdi sir and chetna madam for a beautiful session and thanks to you friends for your sincere participation let's log in for our verse by verse session 146 on 5th may 2023 for the recap of verses 1 to 49 of 18th chapter please log in at 6:45 pm sharp on friday thank you om purnamada purnamidam purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaya purnameva avashishyate om shanti 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 hari om shri gurubhyo namaha hari om thank you